Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll just uh, give it a few minutes just while we're waiting for people to uh, come through and, and join the meeting. Um, so we'll just give it sort of another two, three minutes to, to as people start logging on and, and filtering in. starting to see a fair few more people starting to come through and on. I've just got to shut my door because I think, oh, yes, please. Best laid plans. Someone's just come into the office. Okay, we're starting to get a fair few more people on board currently. Hopefully a few people have got under some of the storms that have come through this afternoon and, and hopefully they haven't caused any issues. I'll just give it another couple of minutes while we're waiting for people to, to come on board and log in. Okay, we'll kick off now. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Littler. I'm with the Local Land Services uh, based at Mudgee. Um, good evening. Uh, this is part of a program that's coming from Saving Our Soils. Um, and it's I'm hosting tonight's uh, webinar. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, and thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, the presentation that we're going to be giving tonight is uh, feeding cattle in dry times. Um, and this webinar is, is going to be delivered by Jeff House, uh, who's a consultant based in the uh, central west of New South Wales. Um, and during this webinar, Jeff's going to cover a number of principles dealing with feeding cattle in dry times, uh, looking at the management of those animals during that time and, and sort of some of the mean, trying to meet the nutritional needs of those animals as well, plus some of the pros and cons of different things. So uh, Jeff's got a wealth of experience uh, and knowledge and, and will be sharing it with us tonight. Uh, before we get to Jeff, um, I'd really like to acknowledge that, uh, um, that we're dialing in from uh, what always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, I pay my respects to the Wiradjuri people, uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land and waters which I stand on today, and also extend that uh, extend that to traditional custodians you're all representing today, as well as elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, really need to acknowledge where our funding's coming from this evening. The, the webinar is part of a series that. Uh, we're bringing to you. Uh, it's coming from Saving Our Soils during drought program. Uh, this project received funding from the Southern New South Wales Drought and Innovation Hub as part of the Australian Government Future Drought Fund. Uh, so we're going to be holding these webinars. Uh, this is this is uh, number four in the series that we've been holding. 
Um, and we've still got another one that we'll be hosting uh, next week. Thanks very much uh, for, for all those people who've registered and come on, on board. Uh, we've got this up, upcoming webinar next Wednesday uh, from seven o'clock to 8.30. Uh, and that one will be on early weaning of cattle and sheep. Uh, covering both species, looking at the pro con pros and cons, etc. Uh, uh, we've got the quiver question to answer, or I, I might be able to try to answer some as well. Um, please feel free on the side of uh, the webinar, there's a question option. You can put your questions in there, uh, type them in, and we'll answer them once we get there. So, as I said, Jeff House uh, Jess of Jeff House Livestock is uh, presenting this evening. I've known Jeff for one or two years. Uh, we we started in the department together as uh, livestock officers. We were substantially younger than we are now, um, 20 plus years ago. Uh, Jeff uh, had done a, a great deal of work um, in the feedlot side of things in the department. He'd also uh, worked originally in uh, a lot of early weaning work with a with a researcher by the name of Lloyd. Phil, so uh, came in. He was lucky enough to be trained, going through the system, of the department, working with with uh, well recognised researchers uh, and and experienced extension officers. Where we were able, he was able to gain some experience. He had the misfortune of being next door to me in district wise, but uh, uh, went through it all. And um, you know, he's left the department a few years ago now uh, and has gone out into private consultancy, where he now works with Alpha and also does other work, working with farmers and producers and industry groups. Uh, so a huge amount of experience knowledge with Jeff. Uh, I've always found him a very practical soundboard whenever I've been talking and, and always a good one to bounce ideas off. So welcome, uh, Jeff, and, and thanks very much for being available and, and talking this evening. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much there, Brett. Um, yeah, and no, I look forward to uh, presenting this evening and look, realistically, those years with the department, um, yeah, put us in good stead for dealing with with feeding animals and, and the nutrition side during dry time. So look, what I want to cover off on tonight, um, really want to talk about establishing realistic targets with your, your livestock, what you're aiming to do uh, with your cattle in regard to feeding during dry times. Talk about identifying limiting nutrients and you know often the discussion swings in a different direction to what what i, I want to talk about um a bit about managing feeding um a little bit about stock health if we've got time but quite brief and some of the resources that are that are out there and available to to help producers make decisions uh, around feeding first slide just this is just a reminder i wanted to throw in there just be really careful um, during those dry times of feeding unusual feeds, feeds that are not produced generally for stock feed. So it might be, you know, there's photos there of potatoes, there's pumpkins, um, you know, cotton trash listed there. Um, you know, there, there's a whole heap of foodstuffs that are produced for humans. Um, that may actually have chemical residues that can cause us a problem in the livestock industries. So we need to be really careful just around what we're feeding animals, um, what chemicals may have been used on those, those um, products. And just because they're fit for human consumption and acceptable for humans, unfortunately doesn't always mean that they're acceptable for, for animals. And you know, we, we can really have a lot of problems there um, with chemical residues. So it's really just to be very careful um, of where you're sourcing your product and what chemicals may have been used on them in the past. They can really give the industry a, a very big headache um, moving forward. If you want to start talking about feeding targets. Now, if we're going to feed cattle during a dry time, um, there's a lot of different terms that get thrown around. So um, from survival feeding, maintenance feeding, production feeding, all of these different terms but look in my mind we need to be feeding cattle for production 
if we're going to maintain, we need to maintain that production in our animals. Um, there's no economic sense in a cattle herd to feed animals for survival or even just truly maintenance, just to, to maintain their weight, just hold their weight. We need all of the animals within our herd to remain productive so that we can come out the other end when it does rain with a productive and efficient herd. The time frames in a cattle herd are just too great for us to allow us the, the sort of, I suppose, the ease of, of not having animals productive. So from that point of view, from a cow point of view, um, I'm really looking at, you know, maintaining the weights of our cows. We'll talk a little bit later on, you know, ideally I don't want them to drop below a fat score too. Um, but they need to stay in the production cycle. So, you know, they need to get back into calf. If I would imagine, you know, we're going to have people from a lot of different areas on tonight. So um, your your schedule and your timing of events might be quite different. But, you know, if your cows are already calved down and the bulls are meant to go out, well, they need to go back out. And they need, those cows need to be joined. They need to get back into calf and they need to remain productive. So we're not looking at running fat cows by any means, but we need them to get in calf and we need to maintain their productivity. Likewise, if we've got replacement heifers coming through, um, you know, in my mind, most herds, you, you really do want to continue to grow those animals. You do have, want to have targets in mind. What is your critical mating weights for, for your heifers? You're going to join them at 15 months of age. Then we need to make sure that we're getting them up there and we're getting those weights into those into those females to join. If you choose not to join those those animals, they still need to grow and they still need to be productive. Um, and you know, in that situation, I, I would imagine you're looking to sell those animals as you know maybe trade weight cattle. You might sell them to the feedlot a bit like you'll you'll do with their steer steer brothers. Um, I don't really encourage people to hold heifers over for another year and join a year later. Um, I, I don't think there's, you know, there's not the profitability in doing that. So you choose not to join the heifers and, you know, they're treated like steers and they still need to grow. And we want modest growth out of those animals. If we're going to achieve half a kilo a day out of those, those younger animals, so they continue to grow and very much with a target endpoint. We want to, we want to move those animals off, get them to a weight so that we can market them and move them off. And then lastly, our weaners, our really young stock, they have to keep growing um, realistically if if they're weaned early and not continue to grow at at least that 0.5 of a kilo a day ideally i'd, I'd rather see that sort of 0 0.7 0 0.8 um, as a target for our, our really young animals we need to get them up over um, about that 300 kilos live weight before we can sort of back off there we need them to keep performing if we don't grow them out that's when we end up with those animals that you know, reduce marbling potential later in life. Um, in the worst case, we end up with those stunted calves that just don't ever grow out. Um, so it's really, a, a really important that we, we actually have those targets and we grow those animals out. And we set ourselves goals with our animals and, you know, potentially reviewing them about every three, three months so that you've got a goal. Where do we want our animals to be? We need to monitor that. Um, we need to weigh animals and, you know, really stay on, on track. A lot of experience with droughts, you know, and, and dry times. Producers just need to keep making decisions. It can be really hard. You can get set in your ways, but by setting those sort of triggers and saying, well, okay, I'm going to review this in, in six weeks' time, three months' time, um, you know, they're, they're really good triggers to, to keep you making decisions and, and keep you moving forward. Don't ever look at the decisions you've made with hindsight. Um, you know, hindsight is a cruel master. And you know, if producers are making decisions, that's really where we want you to be. Continue making decisions, continue to move forward. Um, don't don't look back with hindsight and and decide that you you shouldn't have made those decisions. Just another slide in here quickly too. Just a, a reminder right up front: good quality water is essential. Doesn't matter how good the quality of feed we've got, if we don't have access to good quality water then feeding cattle is really difficult. The quantities you, you see there, so between 30 to 100 litres a day. Um, so 30 litres for younger stock, 
if we've got cows that are lactating, they can drink up to 100 litres a day. And, you know, those top figures are, are across the months that we're heading into. So, you know, if you're in a situation where water is, is restrictive, um, then again, that's going to influence your decision to feed. If for any reason cattle can't consume the amount of water they need in a day, then they will also reduce their feed intake. So it's going to have a really, you know, compounding negative impact on their performance. So we need access to good quality water and we need plenty of it. So, you know, that may well make the decision, preferably through troughs. Um, you know, dams are going to continue to dry in, in hot weather over summer. Um, they'll get boggy away from, you know, around the edges as they drop. So ideally we want water in reticulated systems so that we can manage the quality of it. And ideally away from where we're feeding a little bit. So it um, doesn't have to be a huge distance, but if we're feeding grain, um, we often see this where, where people set up grain feeders quite close to their watering points um, and their troughs. You can get a lot of grain and a lot of roughage material actually deposited into those, into those water troughs because animals will instinctively, they'll go and have a feed and then they'll walk from the feeder and then they'll go and have a drink. So if we can separate them a little bit, just allow more of that, that feed to actually go off the muzzle of the animal before they reach the water trough, that will keep your water troughs clean. Really important too, um, that we keep cleaning our water troughs, we're checking them, uh, depending on the size, um, you know, you, you might be cleaning them once a week, you might even be cleaning them once a day, depending on your setup and, and what you've got there, your flow rates and the like. So yeah, good quality water, can't stress enough how important that is um, to the whole system. We then start talking about nutrition. And it's really important, again, because there's gonna be a lot of people in different stages. So, you know, there'll be people in the north of the state that may well have been feeding for months now, um, you know, may well have been feeding since the start of the year. There might be people in the south who may have been feeding, but for different reasons, um, you know, late last year, and then they might've got through for a while now. So it's really important that in whichever situation you're in, you identify which nutrients are actually limiting the production of the animals. For the majority of the time, the first most limiting nutrient will be energy. So I often like to use analogies when I'm talking about nutrition, and I use the analogy of a, of a motor car. The energy in the diet is the equivalent of the fuel in your fuel tank of your car. If you don't have enough energy, you're not going anywhere. You're just not going to perform. Next is protein. So often during during dry times, protein seems to take a much higher emphasis with people. Often a lot of feeds are sold on based on their protein content. But realistically, protein needs to be in balance with energy. And using that same analogy, I, I like to think of protein as a bit like the oil in the engine. So the energy is the fuel in the tank, the protein's like the oil in the engine. If we don't have enough of it, the system breaks down. But if there's no fuel in the tank, we can have as much protein as we like and our, our engine, our animal is still not gonna perform. So those two need to be in balance. At certain times of year, they get out of balance, depending on the feed that's available. We need to make sure they're in balance. And generally speaking, if we talk about from an energy point of view, we talk about megajoules of energy um, per kilo of feed, and we talk about protein as a crude protein percentage, if we've got 11 megajoules of energy, then we're generally going to want somewhere around 13 to 14% crude protein. It's usually two to three units um, protein higher a, on a percentage basis than our energy level. So that's where we balance the rations. We then start to talk about minerals and vitamins. Now these are really important that animals have sufficient amounts of them. But in the analogy, I tend to talk about minerals and vitamins a bit like the battery in the car. Probably not something you think about every day, but if a particular mineral is missing or a particular vitamin is missing from the system, then again, the whole system is gonna break down quite quickly. So we've gotta be mindful of them, but they're not what's driving production. Minerals and vitamins are really there as a, 
You know, they need to be there at a certain level. If they're missing, then they will limit production. But by having excess of minerals or vitamins, you're not going to increase production in any way, shape or form. And if animals have access to any sort of green feed, often our, our minerals and vitamins are, are actually dealt with. It's when we start to get in that situation where cattle haven't had access to green feed for a length of time that can really start to run into problems. If we then look at the rumen, so we're, we're feeding a ruminant animal. Um, and there's a lot of differences in feeding a ruminant to you know, how we feed ourselves, how we might feed pigs or, or non-ruminant animals. And so a really important part of our ruminant nutrition is actually keeping that rumen functioning well and properly. And so when we're feeding animals, um, if we're giving them energy, a lot of that energy goes into the room and that, that grain, that, that feed that they're taking in goes into the room and it gets broken down by the room and bugs, you know, all the bugs that are in there. They break it down, they produce volatile fatty acids that are absorbed by the animal. And that's a big part of what drives the production of that animal. So that room and really needs to function correctly. And this is where I think sometimes um, we get a little bit hung up on protein because protein is really important to maintain that population of microbes in the rumen. So we do need, if we don't have enough protein, then those rumen microbes will decrease in number and they won't be as effective at breaking down the feed. So we need nitrogen in there. So we need protein um, of some form. So that might be a, a true protein, it might be a, a, a non-protein form of nitrogen that we can we can feed. So that's where at times we feed urea to cattle um, in mixes. That's providing just a little bit more nitrogen to the rumen to keep those bugs, those microbes functioning well. And we need that correct ba balance in the whole diet of, diet of protein and energy to allow the rumen to make best use of its available feed. Because when we start to look at this rumen again, um, there's a lot of different pathways to how protein is actually utilised in the animal. Um, energy is generally broken down in the rumen, those volatile fatty acids are produced, but from a protein point of view, we have protein coming into the animal as food. Now, some of that protein, so we talk about crude protein when we analyse a feed from a, a protein point of view, some of that is true protein, um, some of it may be in a diet as non-protein nitrogen. You know, they get broken down into ammonia in the rumen. There's always in true proteins, there's a small percentage and it does vary from, from one feed to another, what they call bypass protein. So that's protein that's not actually broken down in the rumen, moves through the rumen and then gets broken down later in the animal system. So through gastric digestion, which is much more similar to ours. But if there's excess ammonia in there, then that simply gets excreted out of the system as urea and the urine. Some of it's recycled through saliva, but the majority will get excreted out of the animal. So we need to have it in balance. We can't feed excess protein to try and improve performance. We need our protein to be in balance with the energy that that animal's taking in. And the big arrow there, the microbial protein this is actually the major source of protein for the animal in terms of its gastric digestion is actually those microbes flowing out of the rumen and then further down the digestive tract. So we need to have an actively functioning and proper functioning rumen with plenty of those microbes in there to actually give the animal its requirements for protein. So in a lot of cases, when we talk about ruminant nutrition, we're actually formulating diets and, and systems where we feed the rumen so that the rumen then feeds the rest of the animal. And we need to keep that in our mind. We need to, to feed that rumen and keep it functioning. So, you know, we're working through the different forms of feeds that we might have. So in terms of um, supplements or feed types, there's supplements that we use for energy as an energy source. And generally, when we're feeding animals, cereal grains are going to be the cheapest and most economical way to supply energy. They're the most energy dense feed, with the exception of oils, but 
you know, in terms of our general feeds, they're the most energy dense and they provide a good opportunity for us to get energy into the diet of the animals. We've got options like silage and hay. Silage, of course, we've got to be really careful about uh, the quality of the silage. It can vary considerably um, and also the moisture content of the silage. So when we buy silage in, we're buying a lot of water. If we've made it ourselves, we've made it on farm, then you know, it can be a really good palatable source of energy. Hay, same sort of story. Um, generally, there's no um, set difference between silage and hay in quality. It's just that we can make silage earlier when the plant is less mature and will often be of higher quality in the starting point. So silages can have quite high metabolizable energy um, and be a quite a high quality feed. Likewise, hay that's cut early, lots of leaf, um, lots of color is more likely to be of higher quality than hay that's been cut later. Um, and the plants are more mature and of lower quality. And then lastly, I've got pellets listed there. So, you know, pellets um, offer opportunities in some cases. Generally, they're, they're one of the most expensive ways of actually bringing um, energy into the system and feeding our animals, but they do offer a degree of convenience for producers. So, you know, we, we need to keep that in mind. If we're looking, you know, the situation you're in is going to very much determine what nutrient you're lacking. So, you know, if you're in a situation like this where you've got a, a crop that's, you know, hasn't really got up that well, but it's green, um, you know, there's plenty of energy in this paddock and there's also plenty of protein in this paddock. What we might do in this situation is actually supply um, an energy type feed, so supplement with cereal, grains, wheat, barley, the like, or even a little bit of silage or hay, we're really supplementing there to actually extend the length of time that we'll get grazing out of an area like this. So we're actually, we're not actually supplementing in that situation, we're actually substituting. So we're supplying part of the animal's diet so that we, we get longer period of grazing out of a paddock like this, for example. Um, if we then you know move to an example like this, where we've got a crop um, that's that's failed, it hasn't been harvested. Again, there's still plenty of energy out there in this paddock. The protein's going to be a little bit lower. You can see there's there, there are patches that are still a little bit green in there, um, but the energy is going to be still in that paddock. People often talk about the grain and the heads. Um, you know, you've got to be really careful that we don't overstate that. Um, you know, the, the reason that the header hasn't been through here is because it's a far crop. So there's a a limited amount of grain in there. A lot of the grain is going to be pinched and quite small and may not be used by the animals too effectively. So um, we're really looking at the leaf material as, as our predominant source of energy and feed for the animals. Um, if they get a little bit of grain out of that, that is a bonus. Um, and in this situation, we may actually have to supplement with a little bit of protein to, um, to improve that. Whereas, you know, back in this green situation, there's going to be plenty of protein in, in that situation. If we start talking about options for protein supplements, um, you know, if you've still got plenty of um, dry standing feed that we often talk about, and you know, there's probably not a lot of places in, in New South Wales at the, at the moment that would be in that situation, but that's when we can use things like um, lick blocks, roller drums, fortified molasses mixes. These are all um, systems where we're using a carrier to actually get often uh, a non-protein nitrogen source into the animal. So often it's urea that we're using there. Lick blocks, um, really convenient for producers, but you know, effectiveness is, is quite questionable, um, just basically because of the, the variation in intake that animals have. So, you know, remember doing these workshops for years with the department, we'd, we'd do them in a local hall, I'd talk about protein supplementation and the best methods, and then you'd walk out afterwards and there'd always be youths parked there with pallet loads of, of lick blocks on them. So, you know, they're convenient for producers, um, but they are quite limited in their effectiveness. And they're often quite an expensive way to supply the nutrients. Um, loose lick systems often work a lot better, uh, where you're just supplying a loose lick in, a, in an open container. Roller drums and of course, fortified molasses mixes both rely on molasses. 
as a carrier to get that protein into them. If we end up in a situation where, especially with the fortified mixes, where animals are consuming molasses as an energy source, then we've gone too far and, and we're, we're in the wrong, wrong situation. We're feeding the wrong feed. We're really using molasses as a carrier there. Because it's sweet, it can, it can allow animals to intake um, that nitrogen protein. Once we get to a situation where we're, we're really lacking in feed, then that's when we start to look at um, some of our, our grains. So lupins, um, you know, any of those, those um, sort of grains like lupins, faber, beans, um, you know, we can use those types of things as a protein source. Whole cotton seed is an excellent feed. Um, unfortunately, excellent feed being recognised by, by essentially the whole beef industry. Um, and so hence is sometimes very difficult to source when, when conditions are dry and, and can be quite expensive. But whole cotton seed is kind of the whole package. It's high in protein, um, it's high in energy. And the, so we're talking about the white cotton seed there. Um, you know, that lint and the seed on the outside do actually provide a little bit of roughage there as well. So that's where, um, you know, whole cotton seed is, is an excellent energy source. It's an excellent protein source. But, you know, we would normally use it as a, as a protein supplement. So we're going to use what whole cotton seed to balance up um, our protein requirements. And then we've also got the meals, the oilseed meals, so canola, cotton seed, soybean, copra meal. Um, you know, there's a, a range of meals that are available there that are also generally high in protein. Um, really encourage people to get feed tests on those products because they can vary um, considerably depending on the methods that are used to extract the oil out of them. Um, but yeah, can be really good, good quality feeds that we can use to balance the protein um, in our situation. So again, if we're in this type of situation where you know it's, it's dried off, protein's dropped a little bit, we might use um, you know, whole cotton seed, we might be able to use a fortified molasses mix in that situation to allow those animals to keep functioning, to keep the rumen functioning and allow animals to utilise that feed even better. This is probably our normal situation where we'd be using those fortified molasses mixes um, where we've got a stubble in front of us that, again, there's still lots of energy out there in the paddock. It's quite dilute um, in terms of the quality of the feed, but by keeping that rumen functioning, we can allow our animals to utilise that feed. So they're sort of options that we've got when we're, when we're really looking to supplementary feed. Of course, if we get to this situation and you know there's lots of parts of New South Wales at the moment that are like this, then we're really tipping over. We're not supplementing anymore. We're, we're really moving into a full feeding situation. So you know, it's a bit of a different scenario there. We can use some of those same feeds Grain, cereal grain is still our most cost-effective form of energy. And we're looking to balance a ration with, with a form of protein. When we move to full hand feeding, there's a few other things that um, are really important just to keep it efficient in its, in its system and, and efficient in what we're doing. So really encourage producers to confine their animals into a smaller area, whether this is a small paddock um, whether it might be yards or pens that you've designed, confinement area feeding, um, you know, is, is really, that's a, a good way to go. And, and why do we do that? So we're, we're trying to limit pasture and soil degradation across the whole property. You know, we might have to sacrifice an area um, that, that we can re-sow or we can, we can um, re-vegetate later on. But it also allows us to keep a really close eye on our stock so that we can, we can keep an eye on them and and observe them really on a daily basis. They're not expending any extra energy walking around the paddock looking for food or water. And we see this especially after it rains and we get that short pick of green feed. Animals will spend a lot of time chasing feed that they really can't access um, if they're given access to, to big paddocks. We reduce the spread of weed seeds if we're introducing feeds, grain, hay, silage, um, by feeding in a small area. We can keep an eye on, on any weed seeds we bring in. It greatly reduces our time to feed. Um, ideally, we, we want to try and get those confinement areas you know, close to our yards, close to where we process and prepare our feeds, 
so we can reduce the amount of time and the travel time especially it takes when we we feed out and the other point there at the bottom all weather access it's going to rain and we need to keep feeding after it rains it doesn't rain feed so we need to make sure that we can get to these areas and have good all weather access to them so you know if you're getting to this type of situation we don't want to allow animals to have free rain open multiple gates and let them go over a larger area we actually want to confine them back into a smaller area and, and keep a closer eye on them. Just got one slide here about weaning the calves. Um, yeah, wean calves. Brett's going to cover this next week in detail. Um, just a quick slide. Ideally, don't let this cow slip below fat score two. And if they've got a calf at foot, that's, you know, we want to get that calf off as quickly as we can. These are kind of the old recommendations. You know, minimum 100 days of age, minimum lightest calf 100 kilos. I can hear Brett laughing in the background there. You know, the experience that people have had over the last 10 years, um, you know, there's a lot of people doing it very well with calves a lot younger and a lot lighter than that. And, you know, Brett will, will cover that in more detail next week. If in doubt, wean earlier rather than later. And the main reason I'm talking about it from a, from a feeding point of view is by feeding that calf and cow separately, we're going to save somewhere between 10 to 15% on our feeding costs. We can actually feed a different ration to those two animals individually than what we would as a unit. And there is a bit of um, you know, inefficiency in that cow producing our feed, turning our feed into milk to then produce, feed that calf. So when things are tight and, and conditions are dry and we're full hand feeding, much better to feed those two units separately. But again, we'll go right back to the targets at the start. We need to make sure those animals are growing and putting on weight. So once we wean those calves, they've got to keep going ahead and you know, keep putting on weight. So don't wean them and let them slip. A few other ideas around full hand feeding. We're really in a situation where all animals need to be fed at once. We're not feeding enough feed that all animals are going to um, meet their genetic potential for growth. We, we are limit feeding them to some extent. So we need to be able to allow all the animals to feed at once and to try and reduce bullying by providing ideally several troughs spread apart so that um, you know the dominant animals don't go in there and eat more than they're supposed to. And then we end up with a tail of animals at the end that, that don't get as much. From that point of view, best to draft stock into management groups based on live weight and, and body condition or fat score so that we can actually, those lighter animals, those animals that are in lower fat scores, we can actually draft them off and, and feed them separately and deal with them a little bit um, separately compared to maybe some of the stronger animals that are in, in better condition and, and got more fat on them. In terms of feeding equipment, look, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, you know, I've had many discussions with people. I keep talking about grain as being, in a, you know, the most cost effective. People will turn around and say, well, look, I don't have the equipment to feed grain. Um, it doesn't have to be elaborate, the gear that we're talking about. So, you know, storing grain in hay sheds is, is achievable. You can get a few bales of, of hay or the like, put them around the outside as a bit of a, a bunker. Then, you know, store grain in there. We can feed out grain if we have to with a front end loader. Um, you know, there's there's options there. There's feed out bins that we can have on the back of vehicles um, or trailed units that can take grain out to the paddock. We don't have to have really elaborate equipment to feed cattle. If we've got feed mixes, that's fantastic. You know, that makes the whole process a lot easier and we can control it a lot more, but there are other ways of doing it. We don't have to, to go to that sort of process. What sort of quantities do I need to feed? These are a rough guide, um, you know, to, to minimum amounts that need to be fed. So, you know, for a dry animal, um, 500 kilos, you know, if we're feeding grain only, then we're going to get away with about five kilos a day. So that's just to maintain production. Um, if we go to hay at eight and a half megajoules, the animal's going to eat or, or need at least 7.8 kilos, but they're probably not going to actually be able to maintain the production we want. We then go to grain and hay. Uh, there's different options there. 
The value for silage, of course, is a lot higher. You know, our grain and our hays are about 90% dry matter. So I only contain about 10% moisture. Whereas, of course, our silage is much lower in dry matter. So, you know, it can be as low as 35%. Um, some bale silages might be a little bit higher. They might get closer to 45, 50% dry matter. But we need to know that and we need to take that into account when we're actually working out how much to feed an animal. And some of the calculators I'll show at the end can help you with that. We've got animals that are breeders that are in late pregnancy, then these numbers increase up. And of course, if our animals are heavier than this, so, you know, a 500 kilo animal in fat score two, um, you know, genetically, your animals might be 600, 650, 700 kilos in fat score two. They're going to need significantly more feed um, than these numbers that we're presenting here. So I, I don't really want to hang up on these numbers. The calculators that you can use a much better way of actually calculating the amounts that you need in your particular situation. For breeders that are lactating, um, grain only is not suitable. We need more roughage in the diet uh, for those animals to actually produce milk. So we need to have, you know, at least 50-50 um, or, you know, we could go down to 80% grain, 20% hay in a ration. Um, you know, that's, that's what we're sort of looking at for those animals, not actually uh, grain alone. And in, look, in most cases, from a, the point of view of safety of feeding, um, and you know, being able to do it long term. But, you know, a grain hay mix is awesome. Um, is a great way to do it. We might use grain and cotton seed. Um, we might use you know different ingredients, just depending on what we've got available, what a price is at, and what we can source. They're the real challenges. If we're starting cattle on grain, um, come back to that rumen again. Rumen is designed primarily to to utilise. Um, roughage type feeds, so you know pastures, grazing crops, hays. That's what our animals in the paddock are more used to um, in terms of their their diet. So if we're going to start cattle on grain, we need to introduce it slowly so we don't um, really overload that rumen and cause problems such as acidosis. So we need to feed those animals hay you know, larger quantities of hay for those first three days. We're trying to reduce some of that hunger in those animals so that they're not going to gorge the grain when we start to introduce it. Um, we can then, in the, the sort of next days, we can feed the hay first and we slowly bump up the amount of grain that we're providing animals on a daily basis. And we continue to reduce the hay and increase the grain until we get to what, what we're required. If we've got a mixer, then you know we can mix those together. We can start with a ration that's that's 20% grain and 80% hay, and then every three or four days we just bump up the grain percentage. We we can drop down the hay percentage again. But it's really important that we do this gradually. And one of the really um, key indicators that this is working well is you know, actually if you look at the manure of the animals. So the manure will actually be a really good indicator on how well that rumen's functioning. When animals are on really dry feed, we tend to get really tall, um, sort of mounded manure pats. As the quality of the feed increases, those, those manure pats get lower and, and closer to the ground. But if we actually push the system too far and we, we do induce a little bit of grain poisoning or acidosis, then we can end up with um, feces that are, or, or pats that are, that are really flat. Um, they can be quite bubbly and, and sort of really indicative that that rumen is not functioning well and we're causing damage to it. So just monitor the, the pats as you're increasing your grain and see how you're going. The other important factor is trough space. We need to make sure we give animals enough space. I'm a real advocate when we're feeding cattle, regardless of what the feed is, we want it in a trough, we want it off the ground. Um, again, it doesn't have to be elaborate, but we need to, to get that feed off the ground. Otherwise our wastage is gonna be huge. Um, and, you know, the, the ability of animals to ingest soil and, and dirt when they're, they're trying to pick grain up off the ground is, is quite high. So, you know, we want to provide adequate space so all of our animals can feed at once. We also then want to, um, you know, look at different ways of producing troughs. So, again, they don't have to be fancy. These are tractor tyres that have got a bit of um, conveyor building just covering the hole in the bottom of them. They've cut a bit of the side out of the tyre. These actually make really good 
feed troughs for cows um, where you can put a fair bit of feed in there because they're round they actually provide significant amount of of space and you know you can easily fit sort of 10 animals uh, around a, a tractor tire in that type of situation 10 mature cows um, conveyor building you know this is a system that someone had set up down south where they used um, the fence to keep the animals off the conveyor building but you know there's no reason why you can't just have conveyor building flat on the ground as well um, you know that works the animals will, will tend to trample over it if it's flat on the ground and, and you know they've got free access to it this one has got the advantage that yeah it stops the animals wasting feed and it stops the animals from spoiling the feed but you know again just a great simple uh, method there the younger stock you might you know use sort of build your own sort of troughing like this the one on the right there is just done with a bit of um, lightweight sort of conveyor building or rubber material plastic type material um, the one on the left there is just used um, corrugated iron that's been bent around the frame. Again, just to try and get that feed up off the ground so the animals aren't ingesting dirt as they're trying to trying to um, consume that feed. This type of situation, if you're feeding roughage, you're going to feed that separately. You know, feed that in racks or, or have something around it so that um, again you're protected and the animals don't waste too much. Not a fan of racks where the animals feed from underneath. They can get a lot of um, grass seed and a lot of debris in their eyes. So, you know, those sort of racks where the animals are restricted from, from getting in there too far. Um, but yeah, preferably not feeding underneath. You can go to the extent of concrete troughs. You know, they're fantastic. They are expensive. They're heavy. Um, and it really depends on, you know, what else you might use them for down the track. Do you feed your weaners every year? Do you yard wean and feed weaners in the yards for a few days? If that's the case, then you know, some troughing like this might be um, really suitable for your system. But yeah, you know, just, just remember the expense there is going to be considerably more. And self-feeders, um, you know, there, there are self-feeders around that can, um, you know, handle a mixed ration or a mixed feed. Very difficult to, re to really screw them down and restrict intake. Um, so it tends to be more for, for younger stock or animals that you're trying to actually grow at a higher rate and finish and, and move off from the property. Um, and use those sort of feeders. We come now, just a couple of others, so minerals, calcium and sodium are the, the major minerals yes. um, that are likely to be missing if we're, we're feeding a cereal grain. Um, so we can add them quite simply. So calcium, finely ground ag lime, um, one and a half percent of the weighted grain to a ration. Um, and of course, salt um, will provide us with some sodium. So half a percent coarse salt to a grain diet. Now, most of our cereal grains, our wheat, our barley, our oats, they're all quite low in calcium uh, and sodium, so that's why we're adding them. There may be situations where you've got a lot of salt in your water. If that's the case, you may not need to add additional salt. And likewise, there might be areas where you're quite phosphorus deficient and you need to add phosphorus to the diet as well. Um, but for the most part, calcium, and sodium are likely to be your most limiting nutrients uh, in terms of minerals and the most likely that need to be provided. From a vitamin point of view, most likely deficiency is going to be vitamin A and E. Um, and vitamin A is found, you know, quite quite good levels in green feed. But the longer animals have been off green feed, the higher the risk of vitamin A deficiency. It's about three months without access to green feed. Now, Green feed might, you know, if you're feeding silage that's green, if you've got hay that's got a bit of green in it, then that will provide a little bit of vitamin A. But if it's, um, you know, cereal grain and straw, then, you know, your vitamin A intake for those animals will be quite limited. Some of the symptoms you might start to see, night blindness, discharges around the eyes, and just a general little thrift in those animals. And, you know, we can, we can give an intramuscular injection of vitamin A, D and E that'll give them protection for about three months. And it ensures every animal actually gets that, that um, injection. So, you know, when we, if we're feeding for a short period of time, vitamins are not likely to be an issue, but the, the longer the period of time goes on that you need to feed, then we need to start to look out for the potential symptoms there. Some of the other considerations, I've sort of touched on a couple of those that have gone through. Make sure we get our feeds tested. I really can't stress that enough. Uh, important to know what you're buying, 
get a feed test done, um, you know, not necessarily on the mixed feed at the end, but on your individual ingredients, grains, hay, silage, there can be really big um, variations in the quality of feed. And I know Brett's presented data on that in the past. So yeah, make sure you get your feeds tested so you know what you're feeding. It then allows you to create rations and formulate rations. So to use some of those tools to do it. Um, if we're including buffers in there, there are um, additives that we can add that will you know, reduce your risk of grain poisoning um, to those animals. So you know, potentially we need to make sure that we're, we're doing that all correctly. We need to be consistent in what we do. Once we start feeding, these animals are really reliant on us and we need to be consistent in what we do. We need to weigh out our ingredients so that we're accurate in what we're doing. So, you know, consistency is really, really important. We need to monitor the animals, the performance of animals. Now that can be through fat scoring, um, but ideally you're going to weigh animals. And you now we don't need to be weighing animals weekly or anything like that, but you know, maybe every month, every six weeks, um, you know, bring, bring them in, weigh them and monitor how you're performing. If you're, you're keeping an eye on, on their fat score and actively going out and fat scoring them, that's, that's a plus as well. Sometimes we can get a little bit close and we can not notice when animals are actually losing weight um, because we're with them all the time. And then if we do need to cull animals, if we need to reduce the number of animals we're feeding, cull with a purpose. This was a phrase I actually copied off, off one of Brett's presentations, but you know, cull those animals that aren't performing, cull animals with bad teeth, um, you know, cull for a reason, cull females that are empty, uh, our cows and our females, if they don't get back into calf, they're the ones we want to cull. Don't just cull based on age or, or, or some arbitrary factor. Actually make really good decisive decisions about which animals you, you stop feeding. And because we're production feeding, because we're feeding animals to main product productivity, um, you know, some of those, those yearling type animals, those slightly older animals, we're really looking to feed them to move them on, find a market for them and move them on and, and reduce the, the strain on our feeding. So, you know, we really need to be positive and work through it. Just from a health point of view, look, um, make sure we drench the animals. If feed intakes reduce, which, we're, which will be, um, normally our cows are quite immune to, to internal parasites, our mature cattle, but in this situation, they will lose a fair amount of that immunity. So it may well be necessarily drench our mature animals as well as the young stock. Um, vaccinate, especially for things like five in one. Um, pulpy kidney can be an issue with grain feeding. Um, so make sure we're covering that and we're, we're not losing animals inadvertently through things that are quite preventable at, at quite a low cross. Potentially looking at fly control. Um, you know, if it's dusty conditions, we've got a lot of flies, we might need to, to control some of those nuisance flies around our animals. BRD is bovine respiratory disease. Um, sometimes we can get a bit of coughing and respiratory disease in those animals. There are vaccines available out there, but I'd really encourage you to talk to your vet just around, you know, just monitoring the health of your animals in, in these types of situations. Really utilize the vet um, as a sounding board that you can um, use to, to really keep on top of your, your health challenges. Um, there's a couple of calculators out there. I said I'd, I'd touch on these. So the New South Wales CPI, I've got a, a couple of calculators um, that you can download onto your phone or on a tablet and use. Um, this drought feed calculator is a really good, simple program to use. You put in your individual feeds that you've got um, available, what price they were on farm, dry matter, their energy content and crude protein. Now, these will, it'll put default numbers in there for those. But again, I really encourage you to feed test and get those numbers so you know exactly what you've got. Um, put them in together. You can then make mixes and it'll give you uh, figures. So, you know, what's the energy content of your mix? What's its crude protein? Um, you know, what's it costing you in cents per megajoule of energy or, or kilos of crude protein? And, you know, what's the cost per tonne as fed? They're the sort of numbers you really need to know with your ration. And then this one, you can actually um, you can also put in the livestock and it will calculate how much you feed, how long you're going to feed for, and will calculate costings based on that as well. So, you know, once we start feeding, it's important that we've got enough feed to, to go for, a, you know, a period. We don't want to be chopping and changing 
too often that can cause problems with the rumen. So, you know, we need to know what sort of quantities we need. This is a drought and supplementary feed calculator, so it's similar. Um, it can also put in um, sort of what's available in the pasture and allow you to work through as well and select different feeds and how much you need to feed to animals. So there's a couple of handy little apps there that, that can work. And, you know, I really encourage people to look at those so that they're, they're actually developing something that's really practical and useful for your own situation. In terms of other resources, um, the Managing Drought Guide, look, you know, it's in its ninth edition. I, I believe they're, they're working on a 10th edition. Um, but, you know, this has always been a really valuable resource when it comes to, to feeding animals. Um, really encourage you to download, available on the net, you can download it, um, or it's still available in hard copy um from from different locations LL off, lls offices have often got copies of it really good resource um water requirements for sheep and cattle this is a great crime fact again on the department of primary industries website um specifically looking at water requirements for, for sheep and cattle and also give a plug for the the guide to confinement feeding of sheep and cattle um which is a publication put together by the local land services um brett and myself were both involved in the development of this document um, there's a wealth of really good information in there for, for people looking at confinement feeding, um, you know, setting up confinement areas, what to feed, how to feed it. Um, yeah, just really encourage it. There's resources out there for people. But at the end of the day, it is going to rain. Um, you know, we need to look after the stock. I really, you know, it's really important that you look after yourself as well and your own mental health. But, you know, keep making decisions, keep looking at your options, monitor your stock. To see any decision you make um, in a dry time is a good decision. The fact that you made a decision and you've, you've, you've worked on that, I, I think is, is a positive. So I really encourage you to look after yourself and, and your own mental health and wellbeing. Talk to your neighbours, talk to your friends, compare notes. Utilise your own experience. There's a lot of people out there that have got a lot of experience in feeding stock, and often it's just fine tuning what you've done before. So, look, I hope that's provided some information for you. I know there's not a lot of really specific details there. I think the broad range of, of producers we've got online um, here tonight makes it impossible to really get down into the, the nitty gritty of exactly what's the most suitable for your situation. But Look, there's a lot of resources out there. Utilise the local land services staff. Um, and yeah, look, I hope that's that's answered some of your questions. I'll hand back over to you, Brett. And um, yeah, if there's if there have been questions that come in, I'm, I'm happy to sort of cover off on those. Yep, no worries. We've started to get a couple of questions come, come in. One of them was one that uh, you, you covered there regarding vitamins and minerals, when would it be advisable to administer vitamin A, D and E into a supplement or injection? Um, and the same for calcium and phosphorus. Yeah, look, I, I, from a calcium point of view, um, as soon as you start feeding cereal grains, I, I'd be putting my, my lime and my salt um, out there. Now, if you've got the ability to mix it, um, if people have got... Um, situations where they're they're actually moving grain through an auger you can you can make a slurry and actually pour it on the grain as it goes up with the auger um, you can mix it into a feed mix um, as a dry mix or if you know if you can't do that then you know there is the option to have it separately there just as a dry lick a mix of, of lime and salt um, would be great for cattle if you're in an area that yeah is phosphorus sufficient then you know again you're going to going to start to potentially use phosphorus um, you know just as you normally would in your production system if you're in phosphorus deficient country then you're, you're going to use um, a phosphorus additive uh, in terms of your vitamins you, you've got a little bit longer um, you're sort of really probably looking at a couple of months of, of feeding feed that's got no green in it at all um, before you're really going to start to run into issues with vitamin a and e but you know if you have been feeding for a considerable amount of time then yeah, it's that three months is that window where you'd really be strongly starting to look at um, providing some form of, of vitamin E or A into those animals. 
Thanks, uh, Jeff. Look, and the other one I would cover that calcium is also deficient in, in cotton seed and a few of the other things. Um, we also know that uh, calcium will bind Gossy Pole, so one to be aware of there as well. Um, got a question here. Can we talk a bit more about the pros and cons of, of pellet feeding for weaner stock, Jeff? Uh, yep, sorry, it's probably something I glossed over. Look, um, for really young stock, um, so where they have a really high protein requirement. So if we're talking, if we've weaned early, and I'm sure Brett will talk about this a bit next week too, with those young weaners. Um, if we've weaned early, we've got young animals that are lightweight, you know, even at that 100 kilos, they have a higher um, protein requirement and they require that through a true protein. So in some situations, pellets are a really effective way of, of providing that um, if you don't have mixing equipment. So, you know, they're there. They're, they're an alternative. The challenge with pellets is really their cost per megajoule of energy is usually quite high and we need to treat them like a grain. So we need to be careful with them in terms of the, their risk of grain poisoning. Acidosis um, is, is equivalent to a grain. So we need to really handle them with care and we need to make sure that we don't change pellets quickly. So, you know, if you go and buy a batch of pellets, I'd encourage people to try and go and buy a batch that's going to, you know, feed those young animals, you know, maybe for, for the entire period you need. Maybe it's it's 50 days to get them up to a weight when you can start to use them on a different diet. But try and buy enough pellets that can get them through that period so you're not going and buying another batch. Even though they might be the same, labelled the same pellet, you don't know that the pellet manufacturer hasn't changed um, their formulation or the base grain that they're using. Maybe one pellet was based on wheat, the next pellet may be based on barley. Um, that, to so the rumen of that animal, that is actually like you've just changed grains. So we need to introduce it slowly. If And this is really difficult. We always talk about it in practice. It's really hard to do. But, you know, if you've got a silo with pellets in it, don't let it run completely empty before you start to use the next silo of pellets. We want to shandy them together and do a similar process that we do to changing grains. Um, so, you know, you might need to do that over a week, five to seven days um, to shandy those together. So look, pellets can be an effective feed. It really does come down to cost, but we also need to be careful with how we how we use them and some of the risks that are, you know, they're, they're not a fail safe feed but you know, it might be a way that we can actually get that higher protein into those younger animals in a, in a more effective way. And those young light animals, they don't need a lot of feed a day. You know, you, you might only be talking a couple of kilos per head per day for those animals. So the quantities can actually be quite small. What I would say is for young animals, don't be very careful with your rear as what's being used to lift the the protein, uh, there's there's risks associated there, and and also we tend to find not get the benefits uh, with young animals. So the younger they so when, are, when you're looking at those pellets for really young animals, you're you're often actually buying a specific calf pellet, and they've actually been manufactured by using more of a true protein. So one of the protein meals I, I spoke about might be cottonseed meal, it might be canola meal, more likely, um, has been incorporated into that pellet to raise the protein rather than a, a pellet that might be just fed as a, a drought pellet for mature stock where its protein level is going to be they're definitely going to be raised by by sort of non-protein nitrogen so they're not as effective for those young cattle they, they actually need true protein so you're actually looking at buying a specific calf protein pellet or a calf pellet um, if you can get analysis on the energy value of it as well that's great often they're, they're just sold on protein but unfortunately uh, I've got one here. Thanks, Jeff. Good presentation covering broad range of aspects and maintaining a stock in dry time. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what's your view on suitability of DDG pellets? Look, probably I, I'm happy to flick this to you, Brett, to be honest. Um, DDG is not something that I, I've had a huge amount of experience with in, in over my time. Well, I know you have, Brett, so I think this is this is one I'm going to throw straight to you. Uh, I like DDG pellets. We're having a few supply issues uh, currently. 
Um, I've fed them myself personally, been advising on DDG and DDG pellets now for uh, late 2000s was when I first started uh, working with them. Minerally our whack, you definitely need your, your, your lime with them. There have been in the pellets, they have changed that around. Uh, very, very, very useful tool for early wound stock. Uh, there's a fair degree of bypass protein and the like. They're relatively safe, uh, low level of starch. Um, what I would say is um, you, you probably, if you're looking at feeding sheep, you, you need to be aware that whether where the lambs can be a bit of an issue, but they do have a specific uh, brew for 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 that, that that can help with uh, bladder stones. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, I don't mind DDG pellets. Uh, it's what I fed my calves when I early weaned my autumn calves about three months ago. Uh, that and a mix of cotton seed until I couldn't get cotton seed anymore. Um, next question, Jeff. Uh, you mentioned uh, confined stock during drought head per acre. How many? Uh, and do they recover from poor nutrition during drought for for the rumen? Uh, is is the way? Do they recover from poor nutrition during the drought for the rumen? Yeah. Look, uh, in terms of confinement feeding, look, um, I, ideally the, the smaller the better, to be honest. So we're trying to minimise the the area that we're we're causing damage on. Um, if we've still got cows that have got calves at foot. Then small paddocks, um, you know, we're, we're talking. We probably tend to come down and start talking about square meters per head, rather than animals per acre and the like. Um, but you know, we're, we're talking for for cows, um, you know, somewhere 100 plus square meters per head um, would be what we'd be looking at for those. So small paddocks. Um, for our other stock, we can get away with pens, and you know, down to you know, 15, 25 square metres per head um, is plenty of room for those really light cattle. We can, you know, we can be down around sort of, you know, seven to eight square metres per head is, is adequate space for those animals. Um, it allows us to keep a really close eye on them and, and, and monitor them quite well. Um, in terms of the rumen recovering after poor nutrition, yeah, look, the rumen is an amazing um, vat and amazing organ in an animal. It's changing and adapting all the time. We can, through not so much through poor nutrition, through acidosis and grain poisoning, we can actually cause permanent damage to the rumen. We can actually burn sections of the rumen. Um, the wall of the rumen has got papillae on it, which are like finger-like projections that come in and help the animals absorb nutrients from the rumen. Um, if we have a bad incident of acidosis, we can damage sections of that rumen and reduce the numbers of papillae that are on there. Um, but short of that, that rumen is changing all the time. So yes, we can absolutely um, turn animals around and you know, through good nutrition and good management of the rumen, we can actually adapt that rumen back and, and get that animal quite productive. Where we can run into problems, but those really young light animals, they're the ones we've got to keep growing. We can end up with stunted, type calves if, if they do it too tough early in life. Uh, but for most of our other classes of cattle, we look after them, we feed them well, we can actually, we can revitalize that rumen and um, and actually get it functioning quite well again. So, you know, sometimes that'll, that may need a bit of roughage. Um, so it might need a bit of hay or something in there if you've got animals that are really, um, their rumen's really stopped working. So we, we probably need a little bit of hay and a little bit of roughage in there and we've got to get a little bit of energy in there as well. So. That's where a little bit of cereal grain would come in and, and then balance up our protein to, to get that all functioning. But look, yeah, the, the rumen is truly an amazing organ that um, yeah is regenerating all the time. Um, this is a, a good one, Jeff. Might seem like an overly simple question, but how many times per day would you recommend feeding uh, when animals are in confinement? the entire ration in one go or split over two feedings. Uh, my th thing would then be, uh, and I've said this is a good question, um, are you in fact better off feeding every couple of days, et cetera, when you're actually in this confinement feeding situation? I'll hand that yeah, one to you, that, Jeff. 
that's a fantastic question. Um, yeah, and it's absolutely something that I didn't cover off there at all. Um, when we're feeding so mature animals and we're feeding them just to maintain their production, so cows, we've weaned the calf off and, you know, we're maintaining that condition of that cow so that she's going to get back into calf, get pregnant and continue to perform. Look, we're going to be feeding a lot less than that animal's got the potential to eat. So in that situation, um, you know, potentially feeding every other day where you've got a mix of feed there, um, if you've got a bit of roughage in there and you've got grain, then we can get away with every other day feeding. It's a larger quantity that you're feeding there. So that allows all the animals to get access to it. The, the provisos to that are, we need to have enough troughing that all the animals can get there at once. And, you know, we need to make sure that we're monitoring animals so that every animal is getting sufficient and then monitoring the, the manure and the dung so that you, you're doing that. Probably my preferred would be to feed at least daily. I think that's safer and it's and it allows, um, you know, just to monitor better and it stops the, the dominant animals from, from getting too much feed and, you know, some potentially missing out. So, you know, we, we monitor that. If we're feeding a higher amount and we're feeding younger animals that we're, we're wanting to put more weight on, we're really wanting to, to get production gains out of them, then absolutely feeding them daily. I, I'm happy with once a day. Um, you know, I, I don't think you, you need to necessarily split feed, um, but, you know, once a day feeding, provided you've got the trough space that everything can feed at once, um, you know, that, that would probably be my preferred would actually be to doing that. We can get away with, you know, every other day feeding on those mature stock, but um, yeah, my preference would be once a day feeding for, for pretty much everything. If you're, you've got limited trough um, capacity and you are trying to feed animals for production and, and a higher quantity, that's sometimes where you might need to, to split a feed and feed twice in a day um, so that you're actually uh, got the capacity to feed that into your troughs or into your system, but generally speaking, once a day should be should be enough. And try and be consistent with it as well. Again, it's trying to get that room and to to function and and to um, to be consistent in what it's consuming. Yeah, look, that's a complicated, and we we see the social side of things really kick in. Uh, it's it's where the hard and fast rules that we put down in cinema is spa space that Jeff has talked about really come into play. Uh, where we see problems is when people try to short change the minimum trough space or the amount of feeders, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden what we see in two, three months is this huge tail. And all of, when I go out and do inspections um, during droughts, all of a sudden I go, uh, okay, we've got a 20, 25% pull rate here. You've got animals underperforming, da, 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 da. And you sit down and start measuring trough space and things like that. And you go, yep, that's why. So some of those fundamental rules that, that are in the confinement feeding manual, they're there. We know they're there. We know they're hard and fast. So just that really comes into that feeding and management. And they're all in there as minimums. And if you can supply more trough space, that's better. And <laughs> even even those those tractor tires where you've, you've got separated, um, you know, if you sit down and watch actually after you feed out, if you've got dominant animals in the group, if it's one long single trough, a dominant animal will start at one end and push its way along and continue to wait from one end to the other. If there's breaks in that trough or if the, the feed feed situation, they're separated a little bit, they're much less likely to actually leave feed to go to another spot. So that often gives those shyer animals, those those lighter animals, more of an opportunity to um to get into feed if if you've got more space. And also that monitoring and that that drafting, you know, if you do have animals that are not getting on the feed, they're not performing, then we do need to draft them off and and you know put them in smaller groups and you know look after them a bit a bit more in that situation um the question here is creep feeding an option to get these younger calves off cows earlier absolutely and i probably i didn't go into that because i think brett will cover that in, in a fair bit of detail next week um but yeah look creep feeding is is excellent I, I think it's an excellent management tool um 
every year, not just in dry time. So, yeah, I, I think it's a, an excellent tool to uh, take some pressure off the cow. In that situation, you, you're doing what I, I said before, where you're actually um, you're substituting a little bit of feed. Um, so you take a little bit of pressure off the cow by creek feeding. But yeah, I think it's an excellent tool, and um, it's probably it's an underutilized tool in the beef industry nowadays. I think probably 30 years ago, I remember a lot of those tablelands guys. Um, you know, they're producing for a different market. They're often producing those vealer animals, and you know, every property had creek gates and and creep feeders where they'd, they'd really push those cars along. So yeah, an excellent option. Again, when the animals are light, they, you don't need a, a large volume of feed to make a big difference. But yeah, I'm sure you'll cover that in a lot more detail next week, Brett. Yeah, look, and, and creep feeding uh, is particularly useful. Uh, I was actually on a place recently where the producer had a better paddock uh, with really good feed. If he put all his cows in there with the calves on, they would have smashed it. He actually put the creep on the gate. He put uh, a pellet in in the feed, in a feeder, and all of a sudden, you know, as he sort of said to me, he said, these things are going in. They're aware of what a feeder is now. They're eating that. They're eating the better feed. I've got them up bigger, heavier than what I would have. Um, and experience with the creek feeding side of things where they've, they've been introduced to a grain as, as someone in the north told me, he said, I've never had a shy feeder when I've used creek feeding because uh, they're very, very used to it. Uh, we've had a question uh, on DDG again, which I think we've covered, but what is DDG? It's uh, a byproduct from the ethanol plant. It's dried distillers grain. Sorry, we do use acronyms uh, quite freely. Um, and and it's it's there's there's two forms there's the wet uh, which is the the syrup and and the uh, dry form that comes out that um, that's made from the the process of getting ethanol. Um, okay, uh, this one here: uh, How can farmers maintain regenerative practices, i.e., rotational cattle? Rotating cattle through smaller paddocks regularly during time dry times, Jeff. Look, unfortunately, I, I don't think you can. Um, look, I, I think realistically, in, in dry times like this, when you you get to the stage that you're full hand feeding, um, you're better off actually select it. People talk about sacrifice areas, but I, I think you you really you're not sacrificing the area. You're actually choosing the best area that's the most suitable. Um, for you both to to feed those animals, have all weather access, but then maybe to rehabilitate afterwards. Maybe it is a, an area that you can sow a crop back into quite easily. It's not too, you know, doesn't have too much slope, so erosion's not an issue. Um, I, I think realistically, the, the most um, sound thing we can do is actually bring those animals into a, a smaller area and try and free up as much of our country as we can and take stock off there off there when um, you know feed requirements are, are not able to be met. Um, that's really the best we can do. Trying to rotate through areas, um, I, I don't think is is really something we can we can do that effectively um, when we get into that type of situation. Yep, and I think that's sort of a fair few of the questions. Um, yeah, question here uh, the about the presentation we will. We'll be sending this out. Uh, it will go out tomorrow afternoon, uh, tomorrow evening. Um, also, uh, there's some resources that that are there and available. Um, there's the confinement feeding booklet, plus also the managing drought guide. And Jeff was right. There's currently an update happening uh, with the final review just happening on Friday of last week, uh, which will be coming out shortly. Um, there's a lot of information that we've gone through here this evening relatively quickly. Um, so uh, I'd really like to thank Jeff uh, for, for this evening and, and that, and the fact that we've got so many people hanging on, uh, we really haven't dropped off much at all. Uh, it shows the value that people have put in this. So really appreciate that, Jeff. Um, so thank you very, very much, everyone, this evening. Uh, if if you've got any questions, feel free afterwards to, to email through. We can, can look at that. 
uh, there's there's a range of assistance around in the LLS um, to, to assist you, but also the number of resources, but can't say how important the, the tools that are now available, the drought feed calculator and, and the drought and supplementary calculator. Uh, what Jeff and I, when we started our career, would have to do longhand, uh, now can be done very, very quickly. Uh, I wasn't great at maths, but soon learnt to become a lot better. Um, but yes, and thanks very much, Jeff, and, and thanks everyone for hanging in there and, and being part of this presentation. Appreciate it, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Brett. And yeah, thank you to all the, everyone that's that's joined online today. At the end of the day, just remember, it's, you know, every day it's a day closer to rain. It, it will rain. Where unfortunately, agriculture is a cyclical business. Um, it's gonna rain, conditions are gonna improve, prices are gonna improve. Um, look after yourself and, and yeah, be in a position to, to capitalise on it when you can. Thank you very much. Thank you.